Hey, this is Jake. <clears throat> hey, this is Jake. On this week's podcast, you'll notice a couple things are different. Number one, this week's story is only tangentially related to uh, organizing. Number two, I'm wearing a dress-up shirt. Hmm? I have a meeting later i got to get to. Uh, but anyway, this week's story, uh, I have to start off by saying that there has... I've long been an admirer of uh, Woody Guthrie. He was a folk musician from Oklahoma who, in the 30s and 40s and on into the 50s, was a uh, contemporary folk musician who wrote a number of popular songs, including This Land is My Land, which I agree should be the national anthem. But uh, he would, pretty much during the Dust Bowl times, hit the railroad, go from tenement camp uh, to uh, tenement camp, and you know just document the lives of migrant workers um, often with a very radical leftist social justice theme throughout that whole era, one, a, a national treasure. Anyway, uh, you know, he wrote thousands and thousands of songs, only a few of which he ever recorded. Well, a few years ago, Billy Bragg, the folk musician from England, and Wilco, uh, they got together and got access to his archives and recorded a number of songs that Woody Guthrie had written lyrics for, but never actually recorded. And they produced a series of a couple albums called uh, Mermaid Avenue, Volume 1 and 2. Mermaid Avenue, named after the uh, the city, the street that Woody Guthrie lived on when he lived in Long Island. Um, there's one particular song on Mermaid Avenue, Volume 2, called Stetson Kennedy, which talks about how the, song, the uh, singer in the song is just disenfranchised with politics. So he wants to uh, vote this guy named Stetson Kennedy into, o- Stetson Kennedy into office. And it's been a favorite song of mine for a long time, but I never really knew who Stetson Kennedy was or if it was just a fictional character. So I was doing research the other day and came across this blog by this historian named Robert McDougall. Um, I can post a link on my website to it, in which he talks about some of the history of uh, who the Stetson Kennedy guy was. And I thought it was just fascinating. Um, ends up Stetson Kennedy ran for was a guy who ran for governor in 1952 of Florida, and um, so I think that's where the song came out of. It was, a, it was a time that he saw this candidate and wanted to vote for him, but anyway, the story goes that Stetson Kennedy was a uh, guy who lived in Atlanta, um, and right after the turn of World War II, uh, when all the soldiers were coming back home from Germany and Japan, and um, basically Atlanta was the headquarters of the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan in America. And membership in the Klan had really declined during the war years because, you know, lots of people were going off to service. But as they were coming home, the Klan realized this is their chance and that they were going to recruit and, uh, you know, get back to their former glory. And so uh, just a couple months after World War II was declared ended, the Klan erected a uh, 300-foot cross on the face of Stone Mountain and burnt it to, and burn it so the whole city of Atlanta could see it and they did this to quote let the niggers know that uh, the Klan is back in charge of Atlanta so you know it was popular they were joining recruits and things like that so Stetson Kennedy this progressive left-leaning social justice oriented person went undercover and infiltrated the Klan to try to learn all about their secret practices and things like that and basically found that it was really nothing more than a pyramid scheme to sell you know, robes and titles to its members that were making the people on top very rich and meanwhile just wreaking havoc you know, through the countryside and the city. So uh, Stetson Kennedy documented all this stuff, found all the titles, learned all the super secret code names and passwords and all that and um, you know, started co- communicating to uh, law enforcement, district attorney's offices, on and on, letting them know the crimes they were committing, giving them all the secret information that no one else had to gain access to before. And basically, the district attorney and these other people, they weren't interested. I don't know if they were complicit in the crimes, but it just wasn't getting anywhere. Then one day, Stetson Kennedy's walking down the street, and he sees a, uh, a group of children who are you know dressing up and playing. They're not playing cowboys and Indians, they're not playing bank robbers, but they're playing clan and they're using all you know um you know fictitious really silly code names which aren't the same ones the clan is using but obviously they know what's going on and they're imitating you know their fathers their grandfathers the people they know who are really in the clan and he just was struck about how how sad it is that you know children these are the heroes they have the clan so stetson kennedy on a whim called up the people who were producing the superman 
radio show that was being syndicated nationally uh, and asked them, he said, would you guys be interested in producing a series of shows where Superman fights the Ku Klux Klan? And he got a positive feedback from it. And so over a series of months, he began leaking secrets to uh, the producers of the Superman show. And, um, you know, all the real code names, all the real passwords they use, all the titles they did. And they ran a series of four episodes where it was Superman versus the Ku Klux Klan, where Superman engages, fights, and, and, and beats the Klan. And almost overnight, walking down the street in Atlanta in the 50s, you would see these children who the week before were pretending to be the Klan, this week were pretending to be Superman beating up the Klan. And uh, furthermore... It uh, it was it just horrified the clan members because all these super secret revered um, internal traditions uh, were all of a sudden all over every place and there was children children oftentimes their children making fun of them on the street corner and after that clan membership just just plummeted and um, there's a lot of historians that quote Stetson Kennedy with almost single handedly being responsible for. Uh, the fact that there was not a huge post World War II revival in the Klan membership, and um, something else I read on this guy's blog that uh, really brought the point home is if you think about uh, you know s any kind of fraternal organization that's very secret, they have you know whether it's Masons or Elks or even people who play Dungeons and Dragons in their garage, you know there's a lot of stuff they do inside which you know seems dignified and seems carrying on tradition to them, but once you sort of shine the light on it and show how everybody how silly some of the code names really are, it starts to become a lot less cool. And um, I think that was a really genius way of shutting down the clan. that, you know, you, he used infiltration, he got in there, and he exposed secrets, and it, and it shut them down in a way that nobody else had been able to before. So when law enforcement couldn't do it, when, uh, you know, just talking on the street to people couldn't do it, it ends up that Superman actually did save the day uh, with the help of a man named Stetson Kennedy. And I just think that's a uh, pretty cool story. So I will post a link to that, more information for that, on the blog at jakelowen.com. And um, check it out and give uh, Rob McDougall some props for the historical digging that he did. And until next week, see ya.